so nice to have you here. Um, I'm Lauren Shea. I'm with the School of Education. Um, my background is, is surprisingly similar in the beginning half to Anne Claire and Linda. I also went to Boston University to my undergraduate um, to my PhD in education. I was a classroom teacher for many years um, and now at the university. So, um, and still identify more as a teacher than a researcher, um, although I, I do well. So. Um, I went to a conference, a noontime talk, a noontime chat. Have any of you been to, to one of them with um, CTRL? They've had these noontime chats this past semester. And um, the conversation was about the student evaluations of teaching and where we're going as a university, what, what um, benefits they bring to us and what drawbacks they might have. And the conversation was really fruitful and a lot of um, faculty had opinions and where we we're going and how we use them. Um, and it was, it was really interesting to me at the very end, a younger student, I think somebody involved with the kind of lingual program, and I think an undergraduate student, said, oh, we use this one strategy to assess during class. And it's very helpful. And members of, was anyone there? Was anyone at this session? It was, it was packed, so I don't remember all the faces. Um, and the faculty that were at this meeting were like, what is an exit? What is the strategy? How do I use this? And um, I thought to myself, oh boy, we, we use them in K-12 education all the time to see if what we're doing is working, what our students um, are getting from our teaching, how they feel about our teaching, are they actually picking up what we're putting down? And so we do these sort of um, during the semester, during the year assessments uh, all the time in K-12 education. And our students coming to the university are, are quite used to them. So I approached Kiko after him and said, what do you think about a session that kind of reviews some of the big ones that might give us some insight? And, and here we are. So um, that's my kind of background about how we got here. So hopefully they'll, you'll walk away with a few strategies about um, how to assess during the semester and things that are useful to you and understand a little bit more about um, the types of assessment that there are that might work in your, in your courses. Um, so to begin, I just wanted to um, start a conversation um, uh, let me go over how we'll, we'll run today. So our agenda, we'll just talk about the SETs a little bit, so evaluations of teaching. We'll talk about um, how educators view the various assessment types, educators being in the field of education. Um, we'll talk about why we assess students and assess ourselves as we teach. Um, we'll go over some strategies, and then we'll wrap up with some questions. Hopefully we'll do that in 45 minutes. Okay, so um, if you could take a moment and if you could turn to the person next to you um, and think about this question. Why are you, why did you choose this session? There are 10 sessions right now. Why did you particularly choose this question? So, session. So, take a moment, think to yourself, then turn to your neighbor, chat, and then I'm going to ask you to share out. It's called a think, pair, share. So, um, take about 30 seconds to think, 30 seconds to pair, then we'll share. Would somebody be willing to share? what um, they shared with their pair. Would anyone like to share it to the group? Why are you here? Thank you. Well, I'm here because I, I have been doing this for the last probably 10 years. I, I, I do that. I always advocate that waiting until the end of the semester is is good for the record, but it is useless to me okay. as an instructor or for students. And she agreed with me 100%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, so waiting till the end, what does that do for the students that you just had? It doesn't fix anything for Absolutely them not. in the past. Thank you. Sure. Um, anyone else? Well, what Thank I shared you. with him um, <coughs> is more or less as someone who's working to support our adjuncts in the online programs, um, it's really important that we can get this information out of students and then make it actionable so that we can strengthen the program. Right. Um, so that's really why I'm here. I want to hear more about our efforts across campus to actually see that increase because I do understand that um, it has lowered a bit. Yeah. So if we hear at the end, it's yeah. too, it's, again, yeah. you know, that kind of too that It's a little too late. Um, anybody else want to share why? Thank you. Well, I think because when I have to make a decision on what the uh, session to attend, uh, the final exams were, were fresh in my mind. Mm. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I would like to be able to assess what they're learning as much as possible, but without um, taking too much time or putting too much pressure on the students. Okay. Uh, though, though there's a conflict between that and the SETs in the title, because I don't see SETs as relevant to assessing student learning at all. 
they give you more feedback they, on. They, they tell me something else. Mm -hmm. Right. What did you, what do you really learn from the SETs about what they learned in your course? You kind of get their their view of of you. Um, so people get different um, get different things out of the SETs. Sometimes you get a little ping. Sometimes you get um, a big smile at the end. I mean, there's there's various things, but you don't really get to assess how, what you did for them and how you could have done a little bit better, and then make any changes about it. So um, thank you for sharing that. We, um, we'll talk about the different types of assessments and, and where the SETs fall in, but um, before we do that, I wanted to ask to make sure that everyone knows what the SETs are. So um, if you could just jot on your piece of paper, in your view, it's called a free write, um, what are the SETs? <coughs> what do you use them for? Um, when do you administer them? Who really completes them? Um, so it takes, I'm gonna take just one minute and just, Word splash, throw down ideas, pictures, whatever you want on a piece of paper. And what are these things to you? What does it mean to you when you hear SET? So th this question was a little bit different. This asks you to kind of activate your background knowledge, to activate your prior experience, um, and to kind of get that out before we start this conversation. So um, what do you know about the SETs? Let's get some common knowledge, some common words out there so that when we continue, We've established a little bit, I, as an instructor, am establishing where you guys are so I know where to go. So is there anyone that would like to share just a word, an idea, something that tells me what you know about the SCTs? Yeah, I guess yes, please, thank you. As a new person, um, a new faculty, I feel like I'm kind of confused in that I feel like, you know, what I read of you know the definition of what it is for and how it's used is one thing, and then how it actually functions in real life is something different. And in terms of the utility, like in my mind, I feel like you know coming to AU having been a professional evaluator, so I feel like I, you know I'm very comfortable with the concept of assessment. But like when I looked at the actual questions, I thought, how are these questions assessing? I mean, yeah, I mean these sort of assess my teaching. But a lot of it seemed more kind of, I don't know, I mean, and I'm all for warm and fuzzy, but just sort of like, it wasn't like, a, in terms of like actionable mm -hmm. information and the notion, when I actually read some, I, I sort of, at some point, sort of amusing myself thinking that in some cases, or in too many cases from my perspective, mm -hmm. they seemed more sort of like Yelp reviews mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. constructive criticism. Like, I don't all, you know, tell me what I can do better. Yeah. I want to know, tell, you know, what did you learn? What did you learn? You know, how did, you know, how do they screw up, how can I improve? But at the same time, you know, it's, it's confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I don't know if that like really Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely saw that the first time I, I looked at them because and, and just even in the same question, one person would say one thing and the other person somebody else would say something oh, no, that was not helpful to me at all and you know, these are the best, best, the best, thing the best effort. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> there's there's different ways yeah. so the reliability. Thank you. So, will I share your feelings on the, the actual questions on the the SMTs? We'll talk sometime. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I can imagine. They, yeah. they, they basically measure the student happiness. Right. Right. But right. They don't they always tell you. They don't always tell you why. Right. Mm -hmm. well, um, and that's what the students say, but that's their perception of why they're happy or unhappy. And the real reason is often something else that you have to, you have to try and do between the lines, which can be very difficult. Sometimes the students don't catch on to genuinely bad things. Mm -hmm. Like we had a logistical problems last year in one course and had terrible trouble returning things in good time. I was expecting students to still complain about that. They did this. They should have. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that they're very helpful for is that we ask the students to report how much time they spent on uh, the week on the course. Mm -hmm. I assume that's reasonably accurate. I was glad to know. Did you add that question? Was that one of the standard questions you gave your yeah, 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 course? Yeah. Can I ask, are all the standard quest are, are the are the standard questions standard um, in every school, in every department, in every like in terms of the default questions? Okay. <laughs> yes. Do you have an answer to that? Hi, I'm Doug yeah. McKenna, I'm the University of Edinburgh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's my office currently is responsible for administering the SETs and uh, I'm glad that we're back <coughs> SETs, but I'm disappointed that we didn't title this session. So let's talk about sets. Maybe. <laughs> um, I actually had that at the, yeah, the, the yeah, change. Yeah, that's fine. 
Um, <laughs> there are a set of standard questions that are that go out to every uh, survey that is every section that is surveyed. Um, individual departments have also designated sets of questions that are included in every one of their departments. I know the literature department is an example there where they have three to five additional questions specific to the literature department. And then every individual instructor has the ability to add up to five personalized questions. So the, the majority of the survey is standard. It will vary dependent on whether your department adds departmental level questions and then depending on what you add as your own questions. And just to confuse things more, there are about 25 standard questions. And so students who are taking five classes will receive surveys at the end of each semester that range from 25 to 35 questions. And that is too much. Um, so says the Faculty Senate. And so over the last two semesters, we have piloted a much more stripped down set of questions. I keep saying set. Mm -hmm. um, where the standard questions go from 25 to 10 with still the remaining option for uh, departmental level questions and individual instructor level questions. So that's the framework. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so, so we use them in different ways. We learn different things from them. Uh, but as we said in, at the beginning, some of you are here because they're, they're coming just at a time that doesn't exactly allow you to make any changes for your, to your past students. So um, that's, that's the type of assessment that looks at your end results. It kind of gives you a summative view. In education, um, we focus on two types of assessment. Formative assessment is the type of assessment that's usually low stakes during instruction, during, um, sorry, that's coming. Is that a little better or even mm -hmm. harder? No, no, that's good. Um, so you measure student learning um, with the point of knowing what do my students understand at this point in my instruction? Where am I after I finish this lesson, while I'm teaching this unit, while I'm in the, the middle of this concept? How much did they understand? Um, and then let me make some tweaks. It, it's designed for the tweaking. Um, you know, this particular semester of students really needs help with this, so let me assess and change things right now. And, and I put on all my syllabi, this, this syllabus is just a suggestion. We, we might make changes because there are semesters that I get in there and my students don't have any practical experience in the classroom yet and I have to make changes all the time about how much I can give them until they're ready. So we slow down or we speed up depending on the different groups, but I don't know this information until I use some of these strategies that we're going to talk about today. Um, so the idea that formative assessments are low stakes, don't have great point value, they're not exactly like the thing you're going to put on Blackboard is like, oh, that was your, your 10 points of this. It's kind of just a conversation that you have with the students so you can listen to them and hear what's going on. So you've already done two. You've already done two formative assessments in the time that we've been together in these 15 minutes, and we'll talk about those in a minute. The other type of assessment in education is called summative assessment, and that means you know the grand be-all, the final exam, your big midterm assessment, your quiz that students have been studying for, and now you need to know like what do they know. It's not exactly designed for you to change your instruction. It's just for you to know how, what did they understand, what did they actually learn. Um, so they have high point values, they mean a lot to the students, and the sets are an example of that. It's kind of just, they come at the end, summative, big, end all. So today we're gonna to focus on these formative assessments. What can you be doing throughout the semester? So why do we wanna do that? Why do we want to assess during the semester? Well, you guys gave me some great ideas, so I'm gonna go back on this part. Um, we wanna know what we're doing, we wanna know what we can be changing. So, um, We'll, we'll go over that later. So in education, we know, so that, that was an example, because when you guys were talking, I, I walked around and I listened as you were writing. I walked around and I was glancing on your papers. You guys gave me some feedback. That last slide, this activity I wanted to do, this question I wanted to ask you, I'm not asking it because you told me something. I listened and I assessed and I made a change in my instruction. Um, so 
in education, in cognitive science, we know that learning builds on learning. When you know something about a topic, what you know forms the basis on what, of what you learn next. So when you know that your students know something, you can build on that. Or if you know that they don't have that foundation, you have to help provide them that foundation and give them that structuring and that scaffolding to get there. So it's important to listen to them. It's important to understand what do they know at this moment so that you can make educational changes and pedagogical changes for them. And then you can learn what you can be doing differently. So a big um, strategy that we use in education, and your students are very comfortable with because they've done it in high school, are talk strategies. Um, so you, at the beginning of when we got here, I asked you to do a think pair share. How many of you have ever used that in your classroom? How many of you have heard of it but not used it? Think pair share is a very common um, strategy in K through 12 education. And they start in kindergarten. And like turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor this, then share out. And it's especially good for language learners who need like that extra beat to think about the language, their, their thinking, to put it into language, to share it with a partner in a low stakes environment, and before they share out to the group. When students talk in a content area, when learners, us, adult learners, talk in a content area or talk about something, we begin to make sense of how we actually feel about it. Um, so Karen Worth, a colleague of mine, does research in what talking provides students. Um, when you allow your students to take a break in the middle of your lecture, in the middle of your course, in the middle of your interactive session, and talk with someone near them, their learning solidifies. So it provides them multiple um, learning opportunities. The first thing, like I said, it helps them make sense of what they're thinking. Um, they, you know, when you really start talking about something, you're feeling really emotional, or whatever, you just need a moment to chat with someone and kind of get it out. There's research that supports that. And, and when you talk about the content area, you are starting to put your pieces together. Um, when you talk to somebody in your discipline, you listen to their ideas. You get to hear what, what's, what do others feel about them. You become aware of multiple perspectives. You hear from somebody that has, thinks completely differently from you. You can rethink your own ideas, um, get new ideas, add them into your own, make decisions on what other people think about ideas um, that are being presented in the discipline. And the last thing is, when you talk, you get your ideas more concrete so that you can go to write next. So if you're about to do a midterm exam or some sort of writing activity with your class, and they need to hand you a paper. If you provide your students opportunities to talk with each other beforehand, and you jump in and you listen to those conversations, you'll get a sense of how those midterm exams are going to come out. What are the students talking about? What are they beginning to understand? Um, so we have lots of talk strategies in education that allow for students um, to get uh, to get in pairs, in groups, to chat that take two to five minutes out of your content time, out of your coursework time, that give you a, it's money well spent type of thing. Um, it may take two minutes, but if you take that moment and go and listen to a few conversations, you'll better know where you should go next, or who's confused, or who, um, oh, we've got this ready, let's skip over this next part, I, I can hear um, that my students are, are well on their way. So um, it, these talk strategies allow us to make those assessment pieces quickly, um, without much preparation. And that's that's a piece that I kind of like because teaching is so much on the fly when you a new conversation comes up, a new topic comes up, um, a new idea comes up, you can add one of these talk strategies into your lesson without having significantly planned for it. So this is the one you did before. This was your think pair share. It gave me a great opportunity to jump into, you know, people were like, why are you still me? But I got to, to listen for a second, okay, who's here? Why are they here? And how will I make some adjustments in this presentation so that I can best meet their needs? Um, so there's a, a great sheet put out by um, Avenue's curriculum that's used elementary through high school um, that has these um, three rows where the first row explains the strategy. So the first one that you guys did before is called Think Pair Share or sometimes it's called Report to a Partner. And it gives a description of the activity. So it tells you how to do it. Each student reports his answer to a peer. The student lists to the partner. Then they come back and report <coughs> to the class. And then it tells you the benefits and purposes of the strategy. This 
this allows students to talk to different students in the class, gives each student an opportunity to share and listen. Talking one-on-one -on -one with a variety of partners gives risk-free fluency practice, and they, students practice speaking and listening, and all the other benefits we talked about from Karen Worth's work. So um, posted on um, this session's website, um, I guess it's through um, CTRL, will be a, a variety of strategies that you can use in your classroom that take between two to five minutes to implement, um, including the one that you talked about, but there's um, the, the one that we just did, the three-way interview. There are ones where students can get up and talk to each other, meet new partners. Um, if you find that students are starting to get a little tired, there's ones where they can actually like form a circle, um, form a line, and chat with multiple partners. And these are just quick, easy talk strategies that, um, that are, are worth their weight in gold. So um, next are write strategies. Now write strategies sometimes take a little more to prepare. Um, these are called quick writes. So the first one we did, this was a free write um, where you have students, you ask students at the beginning of a session, the beginning of a topic, take a minute and just jot down what you know, what you feel, what your experience is with a certain topic. So you're about to start um, bonding in chemistry. And you ask students, oh, you know, you have some, you're, you've been in Chem 101, now we're doing this, let's talk about what you know. Tell me about all your prior experience. And just have students kind of like empty their brains on the paper. Doesn't, no point value, no other reason other for them to activate their prior knowledge, activate what they've already experienced. Um, and you can make the choice. You can have the students share that with you once they've gotten that out on paper. You can have them hand it in and tell them, like, I'll give this back to you, or I um, just want to see it and I'm going to toss it and recycle it after. You can make the decision, but it's just a quick way for you to see, like, what are my students coming up with? You take a few minutes, flip through them, read them, either in that session or as you prepare for your next session. Um, but it allows students to connect to their background, and it gives you just a little bit of feedback so you can make these changes. Um, another quick write opportunity is called a reflective write. A reflective write is when you reflect. It comes after your learning experience. So at the end of a class, you tell students and you say, what was the most impactful thing that happened in class today? Or write about one thing that you were confused about. Or write about, um, in one minute, tell me what you thought of this group work that I did today. Um, tell me what you thought about the talk strategies. Tell me what you, um, one big idea about bonding that stuck with you. So something that gets them to recount their experience and get an idea about what did they really take away. You can have them take it with them or you can collect it and then get an idea of what did, what did they feel. Um, and I've seen instructors do this in various ways. Like, you want the students just to be able to pull up all the information from the day just so they have it fresh in their mind when they walk out the door or they want to use it as an assessment of themselves to say what did my students understand what are they confused about and where do I go next week with my information um, and then the next two are more illustrative um, they're about, less about writing they're actually very good for the language learners you have in your class and um, they kind of just give a, they activate another part of students thinking and creativity. So a draw illustrate is a post learning strategy where you ask them to draw, sketch, doodle, jot um, down any ideas or any lasting impressions of your lesson. So you can, you know, if you're doing bonding, they can, they can draw um, what they took away from the, the elements coming together. They could um, draw themselves confused. I've seen students do various things with um, with this drawing piece, um, but it allows for multiple modalities. So students who are not so apt to write about it can kind of map, can kind of draw out their thinking. Um, and lastly, is mapping, and that is when they make connections to other content areas. So if you're working in science, you might say to them, "Tell me how this relates to your major. Tell me how this relates to your Psych 101 class. Tell me how this relates to your background experience." And students will make connections. They can do it with a with a web, which is kind of like the big idea branched out to smaller ideas. 
Um, again, students can hand it to you, they can share it with a partner, but it allows them to reflect on what you did that day and um, where to go next. So you get to decide how you want to use it. Any questions at this point about any of these strategies? Has anyone used any of these before? Yeah, which one have you used? Well, I used free write and reflective write at Rome. I didn't use mapping. Can I ask you how you use those? What sort of questions did you ask? So, I, I teach Tom 100 uh, after talking about you know, different aspects of the internet. I say, you know, as a concept, but how do you picture it? Well, that's what we're I, I tried to do sort of the draw illustrate mapping, um, and it, in my, it, it didn't work well. And it was one of those moments where I'm thinking, okay, this is not working well because I don't know what I'm doing, or they just like their brains are just not picture brains, or like what. It's one of those like. I know, at least in my mind, this should be working. It's not, and I'm not quite sure that I had sort of sufficient, you know, tools in my tool belt to go. Okay, here's how we do this. I ended up sort of back at the moment. Well, you learned something. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 work. Right. Yeah. And so, well, you know, what yeah. about it? That, that's a great reflection. Now, what about it? Can I? You know, maybe it was that group of students. Maybe it was a question you asked, or the time you asked it. But you know, that's part of teaching is reflecting and then deciding through a try this again. Thank you. Um, so I recently graduated with my undergrad degree here. A lot of my professors use these tools, but at some points during the semester where like every student just gets like a little bit too exhausted and just wants to leave class. Um, and when we would do these different projects or whatever in class, um, it seemed like an extra task to be doing. I was like, oh, I just want to like sit here and take notes and go home. <laughs> so what, what tools can you use in the classroom to motivate students that when you get a little bit exhausted that particular day to do this in a very constructive way because I found like, oh, I have to do this reflective, right? I'll just put something down on the paper and get this done okay. rather than actually digesting it really well and providing good feedback for the message. Thank you. That's, that, that's a great point. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, sometimes if you pair a student up and to do these kind of things, the drawing and illustrating and mapping kind of work well because then it's your well, you know, yeah, I can just jot this down, or actually someone else is accountable to me. You know, mm -hmm. I'm sitting here, Christine is counting on me to, to get this done, you know, maybe I'm tired, but she's not, so mm -hmm. pairing up sometimes works to make, um, to get students a little more engaged. Mm -hmm. um, but the technology pieces I'm finding are the pieces that really, like, hook students mm -hmm. in. So when we get to that, maybe we'll have some feedback on um, with the technology, you know, adding the technology mm -hmm. for um, um, for feedback. Does, I'd like to open that up to the floor though. Has anyone else experienced that or have some sort of answer? You're all um, out there doing the same work. What If you've tried one of these, what was your experience with students and um, engagement levels? You know, I totally agree. It depends on the mix of the students. Like, I've taught the same class for a couple of years. And they're intro students. So if you get a good mix of students who are interested or excited, it's the right time of day, then they will share nicely with you. You interact in the chair. Then if you get like a combination of students who are not so chatty or whatever, then it's just like dead silence or they're not you know, they do like you said the bare minimum they just wanna do it and get out of here and move on. So how do you how do you kind of well create that enthusiasm consistently? I think that's the challenge for me. My teaching style is to just be real and say that it's very helpful to me that I'm here for the students. Um, and especially as an educator teaching future educators, these strategies are gonna be used as ones that they will actually use with their students. So I'm modeling how do you use it. So I, I wanna be as transparent as possible and say, when you give me this feedback, I can be better for you. And, and that's why I'm here. You know, I, I love what I do. I want to be a better teacher for you. When you write these things down, when you draw these out these ideas for me, you let me know what you know and where your confusions are and then I can do better for you. Um, but that's my style. I, you know, I don't know, you go with you. Um, so do you do, as well, well I was just going to say that, that 
in my experience with working um, in assessment, what I found is that students don't always know the reasons and the connections between the assessments that we do and the learning outcomes that we have and the assessments we do and the reasons why we're doing those assessments. It's obvious to us. It's not always obvious to the student. So I think making some of those implicit things explicit, like you said, say um, this reflective, you know, I'm sure if it was done at a contest, a student would say, I just didn't feel like being reflective right now. I want to get to lunch. Um, but if you say, if you draw the connections, I think, what I found out to draw the connections and say, like you say, that just take a few minutes as you do this, and I get themselves back from everybody, I'll be able to reflect on what you say and use it to make the class even better, then I think there's a reason for students to invest in it. And then I think if we don't tell them the reasons why, it makes it harder for students and it, to, um, to want to do it. Okay, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. And, even, and even in the summative assessments, Mm -hmm. Those same sort of questions and the same, that same sort of reality and honesty can come through. Like, I'm giving you this paper because of, these are my reasons. These are my objectives with doing this. I'm not, you know, not because I just have to give you a grade, but I need to know your learning so that I can do <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, well, my, my point is quite different here because I keep hearing that uh, <coughs> you are here to help me out to become a better teacher, which I'm against that. I am, I, am, I am a proponent of the idea that we are part of a group, I am a facilitator, mm -hmm. you are paying for that course, it is your future and I am here to help you out. Mm -hmm. So you are not going to help me out to become a, a better teacher. Mm -hmm. I am trying to find out from you as a group mm -hmm. what is the best way to go about transmitting or facilitating learning that objective of that particular course. So that that approach I take mm -hmm. because really and, and, and truly and I mean I, I benefit from the comment at the end of the semester by students, which is basically subjective. I, I mean mm -hmm. some students would say I learned nothing mm -hmm. in the course, which is sometimes it is true <laughs> because you were not paying attention. <laughs> but 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 the fact of the matter is that uh, that sometimes we jump into the false conclusion that I have my students here and they are all excited about uh, facilitating or about expressing themselves. We ignore the fact that in order for them to speak up, we have to establish a safe right. environment for a couple of weeks in order for them to speak. Sure. Sometimes it's very hard even when graduate students to speak openly. Yes. So we have to develop a way by which they will disseminate information or express themselves into a very safe way, which, for example, what I, I do uh, after the third, fourth week, I step out of the classroom and I open a Word uh, file and each one of the students will come and comment on the course. Mm -hmm. So we don't know who is who. Yep. And then one of the students will capture that file mm -hmm and we'll make the assessment and then we share all the inf information here with their complaint and their nice words mm -hmm. and their comments about my neckties and then <laughs> I will tell them that some of their objections okay. I will answer them and sometimes I will say I can do this and sometimes I say I can't do that and why? Right. That's how it creates a healthy em em right. environment. Yeah. So, so in, in conclusion the concept is Please help me to be a better teacher. I think it is, it is for me, it is an un, un, unreal uh, mm -hmm. uh, objective. I, I, I'm I not hear. interested in that because I am who I, I am. I'm trying to develop, but you are the clients. I, again, okay. I know academicians, they, they don't want to hear the term client. <laughs> I was an academician. I went to business and I became an academician <laughs> again. <laughs> So I know what the term client, client means, right? but really we are there to facilitate. Mm -hmm. And I don't consider myself teachers. A teacher is, is Aristotle and Newton, and I'm not one of them. Yeah. Well, hey, my mother has told me my whole life, how boring would the world be if everyone was the same? I mean, art teaching is a science and it's an art. So there, there are nuances that we'll all have of how we want to make that look. One can call it, help me help you, and one can say, you're my clients, and th these are the things I do for you, clients, um, 
But the strategy you just suggested is another way to get to elicit their thinking and to and to get the feedback and decide I can make this change for you and I can't. But imagine you hadn't done that. Imagine you waited till the end and you heard all about your neckties at the end and then you know you wouldn't be able to make any of those changes that sure. they suggested. So Absolutely. it's all just different ways of formatively in the moment assessing and being able to move forward in the best way so that they learn. They're here to learn, you know, you have objectives for your course. How do you meet them? And every group of students in front of you is going to be different and, and will probably meet them differently. So I think in the interest of time, we need to move on. Thanks. I'm, I'm so sorry. Please. Um, that was I have me. a suggestion for the, in terms of how to get Thank you. students more interactive um, you know, when they're tired. And I tend to put most of my interaction, that, so I teach a block class, so I have a lot of time, but okay. I tend to put most of the interaction at the beginning. Oh, okay. Because at the end, you know, you're thinking about the next thing you have to do, or you're hungry and you want to go launch your, you know, your next class, and things like that. And even if I want, you know, I mean, so, so then the problem is you, you only get this sort of post-learning assessment halfway through the class, or about the second half of the class. You know, always start off the next class with what do you remember from the last class, or you know, what things were confusing, or now that you've had a chance to reflect on you know, the reading that I assigned in addition to what I lectured about, you yeah. know, what, what is there. So, so I tend to have the, a lot of interaction like the first, in a, in a block class of two and a half hours, the first half hour or so is, is using these kinds of strategies there. And then at the break, there might be another one. And then the second half is really pretty much lecture. Yeah, that's, that, that's great. That get them with strong energy at the beginning. So that actually will bring me to um, a, a strategy called exit ticket. Um, which is can be used as an admin ticket. They're exactly the same thing, except one happens, the exit ticket happens as students walk out of the class, and an admit ticket happens when the students walk into the class. So um, these are typically used, and uh, probably coming from undergraduate um, or from K-12, you know that they're used in K-12 all the time. Um, so you kind of just, they're usually called three, two, ones, um, and you decide on three things you'd like to ask them, two things you'd like to ask them, one thing you would like to ask the students to kind of reflect, to conclude, and be able to hand you something as they walk out the door. It's their ticket to leave. Or, contrastly, if you'd like to use these strategies when, they, when, they, when the students first enter, you use it as a way for them to come in. Like, we, did, you know, we finished with lecture last week. Um, when you walk in the door on Monday, please hand me this admit ticket. And um, so here are just a few examples. You can use you know, math, whatever your content area. And so you basically say something like, what are three things that you learned? You, you can design this however you want. What are three things you took away from today's lecture? What are two things you're confused about? And what is one overarching idea? This is like the idea of three, two, one. Um, or you can ask a content-related question. Um, so you guys will complete one on your way out. And I chose to say, what are three things you found interesting today? What are two types of assessment? So I'm asking the content question, did you actually learn this content? And what's one thing you still want to know? And to get out, you need to hand me this. For us, you're not going to eat. You know, it's, it's this idea of like, I know you're hungry, but please, you know, let, let's figure this out. And then you take these, they take 25 seconds to look over, and you know where to start next week. Well, I, I see that you, know, there's, you guys still want to know about this, and so I'm going to start with that or when they enter the classroom, you quickly look at them as everyone's getting settled, and you can begin your interactive pieces using the admin tickets. So um, there's just another strategy. I've seen them used in higher ed math classes, um, very easily, but there's actually an equation, like the last one is an equation to solve, or terminology, vocabulary, um, and you can ask about your teaching style. You know, what's one thing you disliked last week about the group work or the student talk strategies or something like that? And just get, just get a little feedback. I just wanted to share that this is uh, used extensively in the AUX courses that are okay. being taught for all first year students. They use that, um, they use this for almost all the classes. Okay. And how, how are they find? Do you get feedback on oh, like I their... Teach in the course, oh, okay. but, but I know that um, in the pilot year it was, it was used extensively and the faculty that they were teaching I found it very, very helpful. Right. Especially for that starting point for the next, for the next class. Thank you. Um, and so you, and the, the Thing that's a little bit different about this from the other strategies I chose to present today was this does take a little bit of preparation if you want to um, print something out that's defined for the students but I've also seen faculty members and, and k-12 educators just have a blank one kind of like the top well a little less than the 
the top example, but it just says three, two, one, and then they quickly write it on the whiteboard. This is what I want for three today. Um, and you just rip out a piece of paper from your notebooks and go from there. So you, you can adapt it really quickly where you don't have to do as much preparation. But the student talk strategies, the right strategies, really don't take as much um, preparation. But one um, strategy that um, I'm kind of new to as I get a little more tech savvy um, are the polls to use online. Um, who has experience with polls? Oh, oh yeah, you're online. So you, um, yeah, you can do that, of course. Um, so, um, they, I found them very useful. Does anyone want to give any feedback on um, their experience with polls? So a, a poll is where you um, you can design this to look however you want. So um, for the poll that I created was I wanted to ask a question to see if you understood some of the content. Um, everyone takes out their phones. You take you have a question. You take out your phones. Everyone types in their answer, and it immediately shows up on the screen as what people are coming up with, and you you see the instant results. So um, you know the question that I was going to pose was what's one benefit of having your students talk to each other. You send a text from your phone to me, and you put your answer in, and it immediately shows up. Um, and then so you get instant feedback. Did students? Okay. You have an hour. So. Sorry. You have half an hour, so you're off. Half an hour? No, ten, ten fifteen now. Right. So it ends at ten forty-five. So you have half an hour left. I thought it was. Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, so let's let's try this. Let's take a minute and let's try this. Um, so if you can, if you have your phone nearby, send a text to the number three seven six zero seven. See how this works. It will come back up again. Yeah. Sorry. I think it's good. Oh, it's close. <coughs> On my computer, I could just hit the link. You can just wait till everyone has the link. And okay. The so, um, in the two section, um, the two is three seven six zero one. Seven. Oh, yeah. Wait. Six, zero, seven. Oh, seven. Oh. Her glasses. Uh, and then in the what you write, write Lauren Shea five two seven, and then enter, and it will say, okay, you've now been connected to Lauren's poll. Service access denied. Oh, you try again. Wait, so then I Alex I, is in, yeah. I just went to the the, the poll ev.com. Oh, okay. I, I did it and I got a, a response. Mm -hmm. It said we noticed that this is the first time you've heard you're participating. FYI, blah 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 blah. blah. So this connects me. Okay. And then I would then. And then did you write Lauren say? You say your D. Um, if you after. Um, did this part? Did you write Lauren Shea five two seven? Yeah. Okay. The, and then okay. And then yes. And then pick um, what is the benefit, and then A, B, or C. Okay. So actually, I got a message that the poll's not open. Yeah. So it's good. Yeah. Because it's about the Lauren. It's uh, there's no space between Lauren and Shea. So you have to activate the poll. It says you just have to activate. Okay. What once I have it open? Yeah, it's not open before the poll. Yeah. Mine says you joined, so it seems open. Um, it, 
Well, so yeah, this is this is why I'm new to this and nervous about it. Um, <laughs> So you have to go to your admin account and just hit right. activate. So yeah, and do you want to see what, what it shows up? Because it shows up on the screen. So, so, so yeah. did that, did that. And it says Bermuda, and then I respond B, and then it says Bermuda. Oh, maybe because it hadn't been up here yet? Mm -hmm. Try B again? I mean, I, I can be when it was put. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if we activate it here again. I practice with it at home and it, it works. So, again, ask yeah, so it's again, it said that the poll had has not operated open, so open the poll yet. Yeah. Try again, they have activated, <laughs> activated the poll. So, it sounds like there might be a distinction between opening a poll and activating. Do you have their full everywhere account already? Yeah. Well, I don't know. 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 I don't Okay, my, so I, my so online expert. So, are we supposed to go to a website, or are we supposed to do a strict case of technology? So, in theory, in in theory, how this works is that, um, and and like I said, I really wanted to try this with you because this is new and this is exciting. But it's not something that I'm obviously very comfortable with yet. But I, you know, this is a, a different um, forum that students are starting to get more comfortable with. Apparently, I have to be logged in from my own account um, to do that. So when I practiced, it was my computer and could do it. So um, so I guess I go to my polls. I'm going to see what happens on my computer and look at my poll. And maybe I can activate it here. Um, this is a, That was a screenshot I put in as a play saver. Um, so in theory, we as the respondents should not have to go to the, the poll everywhere website. We can just do it. Okay. So um, can I ask you? So I just reactivated it on my own account. Um, if we try again, oh, there we go. I got one. So immediately, when when it had it been my own computer, and in most cases it will be your own computer. Honestly, that part was very easy. The only tricky part was that I couldn't activate it because not my computer. Oh, okay, great. Okay, thank you. I guess I had to just sign in. Good to know. So as soon as you hit your button, you hit your entry, it shows right here and it can lead to the next conversation. Oh, and, if, and if you try to respond more than once, um, it'll tell you that you can do that. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, great. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> thank you, whoever said C. <coughs> so one thing we uh, every uh, instructor in NU we all have Outreach accounts. Yeah, I'm sorry, we all have Outreach accounts yeah. for our names. We just we, we need to which is a survey software. Yeah, it's a survey okay. software. Mm -hmm. Instead of but is that a poll software? It does the polling too, yeah. And you can collect responses with the QR codes too. They just uh, them in preparation for this session and things I wanted to do in my own class. What I liked about this one over the, um, over there was poll everywhere and survey poll. Um, this one allowed for something as, sorry, as, um, as this gentleman was saying before, um, where you, there's something called a word splash. Has anyone ever used a word splash? 
Um, and it's the same idea where students have their phones um, and you ask a question, you know, what is one big idea that you got from today's session? And everybody will, in their phones, respond and formative assessment, assessment, SET, whatever you'd like to say, and it puts the words big up on the screen, and the bigger the word gets, the more people have said it. Um, and so it kind of gives you a sense of what, what students have um, done. We can, let's see if we can, we can try that. All right. Which feels the same way. So if we go back to that. Um, back to the... Yeah. I wanted you to see. Ah, this is good. Um, I'm not going to be able to show you on there. It has my poll activated on. Um, so a word cloud. Um, one word from today's session. Okay, so now this one, try one word from today's session, and you'll text 37607, again, okay, the same. The same, that same thread. Lauren Shea. Mm -hmm. You can respond as many times as you want in this one. Yeah, once, and that's the nice thing. As soon as, um, as soon as you've already written on my chain, whenever you come to my class, you just write on my thread my conversation. Um, okay, I just sent your computer the link so you can show it up there, not just here. Good. But it's coming in <laughs> like that. And in, in theory, um, when it's on your own computer streaming straight up, the students can see what everybody's saying quickly. How did you send it? Uh, Uh, but it, it allows for um, polls um, where you have bar charts, word clouds, you could also do pie charts. Um, I looked at a whole bunch of different ways that you can um, arrange the information so that it's, uh, you know, you can do different colors. All, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do it. It can be lists, you can make it into blocks, um, graphic organizers. So it's kind of just something fun to play with that you can get assessment in those moments. You can make one question out of, I think, five or six questions um, and get feedback really quickly. And again, low stakes. There's no point value. You're not being assessed on it. If someone chooses not to actually send the text, you will never know. Um, and, and on the AU, where I, would you know if, if everyone participated or not? From setting the From them? Yeah. yeah. No, it's okay. okay, well, so far we have um, big assessment, smaller set, free, right, medium, 
feedback, formative, engaged strategy. But this big assessment means that most of you who answered that assessment. So it's kind of you know that's kind of hard to see. But that's the word cloud option. Um, so yeah, I wanted to be able to have that in there so that we could um, and see. And can you save what you get? Um, like a premium I, I did it with my free account, but I like screenshotting, so I just, I just took a picture of the, um, you know, as I played around with it, and then I, I use it as a placeholder too, so I know what, what I'm about to ask. Um, so another quick way, a little more engaging for students, because they probably have their phone on them anyway, um, or they can go on the internet if they're taking notes on their computer, they just open up another browser, and, and like we said, once once you're already established, you don't have to go through the, you know, text 3760. Seven type of thing. You just open up that same thread. And then we talked about exit tickets. So um, what I'd like to take a moment and do is, is create an exit ticket with you guys. Have you guys take a second and fill out this exit ticket so that I can get some feedback. Um, uh, yes, please take one and pass it. Thank you, sir. And just pass it back. <laughs> because you have another real exit to get your evaluations on your seat that are required of you before you walk out, um, what I'd like you to do is fill that out, and then if you can just hold on to it, I'll use that, but I, I want to take a minute um, for questions. So um, let's do three minutes to fill that out, and then we'll do some questions to close up. Just a question on the how do we get out of the pool? Because is your class now going to be clouded with things like stop or whatever? Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, oh, I see. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I just closed that. I just closed my um, text chain, and then I can end this session once I close it. Yeah. It should end. Uh, okay, so as I collect these, um, I wanted to open the floor for questions. Um, are there any outstanding questions? I know kind of rushed the last part, but um, so either questions and or things that you have tried that you would be interested in sharing with the rest of us who are seeking these sort of strategies. Can I ask a question on behalf of people who are dealing with um, long sort of basically teaching environments? So I teach from nine to five. So it's a Saturday class with graduate students. They have spent all week working. They, um, the snark can be real. <laughs> and so I've never done this type of assessment, but I'm finding that maybe it would be really interesting to allow, almost try to bring some, you know, maybe humor into things, because we talk together all day long. So by five o'clock, they are so over me. I am so over them, and it's been like a performance, you know? So I guess I'm just curious, you know, if you're talking about a really long period of time, but yet I'm realizing that end of term assessment is not as effective as it should be. Um, what would you recommend, or can you comment on sort of doing with not just the graduate student scenario, but then also the, you know, eight hour? Yeah. Um, so having been in a classroom and, teach, and having taught various age students all day every day, changing it up is key. Yeah. So you know various formats of small group, large group, lecture, back and forth, up and down, the one that move close to play, get up, move around, um, get feedback from them. Um, you know, sort of things that you're all you're doing anyway. But that that's a long, that is a long lot. Um, so technology, yeah, if, if that can get, you know, yeah. if you play around with it enough to be able to um, bring that into the class. Any, any other suggestions? I'm, I'm just running out of what I would call espionage, which is um, there are often <laughs> students who you develop a rapport with for whatever reason, and sometimes they may be complainers, but more often than not, they're people who are engaged in the class. And I've gotten feedback from them that's helped me enormously during the course of the term, you know, on a project that we've done, on a lecture I've given, on a discussion we've had. And it's either enabled me to tweak the course as the course evolves, or 
it's given me some ideas to explore like for the next term. Nice. So I think, you know, to me, there's no substitute for like basically talking to the students yeah. and asking them what they think. And I don't know that it necessarily has to be like systematized, you know, via internet. Those are all good things. But at the end of the day, whether it's at office hours or at lunch or in the case where I teach, we take students on site visits to meet practitioners or on the metro stuff for you know days. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I ask them yeah. and they tell me. Yeah. And they're incredibly candid. Um, and I found it very helpful. I also use Google Docs. Um, and they don't know I use it for this reason, but um, sometimes I, I have something called like Ask Prof C, mm -hmm. and they just send me questions. Sometimes the questions are content related, sometimes the questions are about something related to the course. Mm -hmm. uh, they're anonymous, so nobody knows. I can see who's asked the question, but it, it also uh, it not only elicits sort of information and insights about how you can. Um, shape or reshape the course, but it's also a vehicle to get people to participate who may be more reluctant to participate mm -hmm. because they're timid or, you know, whatever, or they're thinking and, you know, there's a kind of mind-to-mouth, uh, as there is for yeah. me, <laughs> kind of barrier. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. But, and then to speak to your, your former point, nothing, the field of education, the thing that we stress most with our students going into classrooms, nothing nothing trumps the relationship aspect. Your rapport with students, how safe, as you mentioned earlier, that safe environment, students don't learn if they don't feel safe. That, that, that is a proven empirical fact. If you don't feel safe, you can't learn. So you, you can't do much if you're, if you're constantly stressed. So if you have a nice relationship with students, you have students who feel safe in your classroom that you can have an open conversation, absolutely. They're the ones that are gonna give you your best feedback, will help you shape, you know, to, and again, in, you know, depending on style, but that vulnerability of I'm a human too, I, you know, I'm doing my work, you're doing your work, but let's talk about how we can do our work better together. Um, you know, those, those conversations are very helpful. I, I like the Google Doc too, that's kind of just, it's, it's simple and it just makes sense. Thank you for sharing. Any other ideas? Anything you've tried? <coughs> Which is, in terms of like the idea of using formative assessment to sort of potentially sort of slightly steer or sort of shift the, the syllabus. And I ask that in part because um, that's sort of what I, you know, tried to do. Um, but in the, but I think that there were many students for whom the, the idea of like, you know, they sort of seem to regard the syllabus as if this is like some sort of like contractual document. And if you change it, people just like, lose their minds mm -hmm. and so I had you know one couple students who were just like adamant that this was you know completely torpedoing that you know they would have done well on the course if only blah 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 mm -hmm. and it's become this like huge you know production and so trying to figure out like how do you I mean if, if so if I guess what I'm trying to say is just what extent <coughs> you can't say, oh, I'm going to teach, you know, a biology course and now it's turned into English literature. Mm -hmm. Like that's, you know, but but when you sort of say, okay, this is, you know, we just, you know, it has become determined that the idea of having, you know, a multiple choice final exam is really useless. Mm -hmm. um, let's, you know, focus more on an area where you're actually going to learn some stuff. Yeah. You know, like how far can you go? Fair point. Yeah. Oh, um, so having been a student who needed that organization in my life, where I was like, I know my paper for this class is due here, I'm having a test for this class here, and <coughs> structuring my life around that, to be able to actually move, when, when professors would move due dates, that's what messed me up. If you can change how you teach, like, so when I, when I formatively assess my students and I know like, okay, this topic took us longer than I thought, and I need to move a topic, or I need to expand this, in my mind, I can I have to do all that without changing due dates because I, I throw them all off. So I, I'll say like we might shorten this piece and add to you know voc more than our vocabulary acquisition in a classroom. They needed more on that this semester, so I'm going to make that a longer session. I'm going to put that over two classes, and I'm going to shorten this intro to writing piece or something like that. Whatever the question would be. But the due date for when that writing assignment is due stays. 
So if there's a way to manipulate the actual the content of what they're doing in class, the activities you choose to do in the class that they don't really know about yet, but so the the syllabus and like what we're doing each day might shift on your own planning, but those like this homework and this paper and this you know those big summative things kind of stay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean I guess the way when I like we're like, okay, instead of having a final exam, we're going to extend the deadline for the project to blah, 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 so you can spend more time on the project. You can get feedback on that, too. Take a vote, make a decision, or or in your mind, you know, you say, we're, we're going to do this, and if, they don't, you know, if that's what works best for them, because you've assessed it this semester, and you and know you that's say for the them. whole class, on whole, I've, you know, considered this an, uh, on whole, this is going to benefit everyone, blah, 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 and then you have one student that decides that he does not, that they disagree with you, and... <clears throat> you know, Anyone speak to that? Well, I was just saying that, um, you know, to circle back, we focus on the learning outcomes of the course. And the reason why we're making adjustments is to better meet the learning outcomes. And so I think that those learning outcomes are everything. And if you can focus on, at, you know, as I'm seeing how things are going in the course, I'm recognizing that the best way to meet the learning outcomes is not to have you study for a multiple choice exam. That's probably not going to help you right now in terms of being really meeting those outcomes, but the better way to meet those outcomes based on where we are now for this class is probably to extend the time on the paper because you really, in order to meet the outcomes, you really need more time for the paper. I think focusing on the outcomes and bringing it back to the outcomes as opposed to the processes is something that, um, at least for me, from my perspective, is something that's really important. Sort of related as well. I think so I have mentioned a final in a paper, and occasionally students will come and ask if, you know, it turns out they've got three other papers in their other classes and they want to shift. But I always, if it's on the syllabus, I basically say in order to change it, I need everyone to agree if even one person, because people have planned. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing on the homework, so I also have weekly homeworks, but I can actually make those the assignments available throughout the semester. Mm -hmm. And I basically say, I'm going to change, you know, I, if we don't, when homework will be due is when we hit the end of the chapter on that topic. And so you can plan. And, you know, so if we don't get to the end, for instance, because we've taken longer in class, and I say, you know, no homework's going to be due this week, but recognize that we're going to finish the chapter within the first, you know, 10 minutes of next class. And so you can already start working on it so that they can sort of plan, but it gives a little more flexibility um, than, than, you know, sort of saying this is always due at this time. And, and if they're really, you know, energized, they can actually do all the homework in advance if, if they want. Um, but, but it helps them to plan, but it, it does, I, I just say right up front, you know, I'm going to tailor this to your, um, you know, to how the class is going, and we may go more slowly, and we may go quicker, so the syllabus, the topics are just a guide. Thank you. Great. I think we still need to find a way by which we can encourage students to complete the SET at the end of the semester. This is very challenging, and as far as I know from my students, they don't see the benefit for them mm -hmm. to complete it. Um, thank you for bringing it back to that, because it is time to wrap up, but there has been established a task force to look at the SET and what faculty think of them, what's going to happen moving forward. Um, and. What our department recommends, and this is what we end up doing, is on the day of the last class, I hold 20 minutes, we find 20 minutes sometimes, you know, like the craziness of preparing for the, the end assessment, um, and ask them to use that 20 minutes, and I leave the room, and I have them all bring their computers that day, they open up and they do it right then and there, 20 minutes, all of them, all done, they don't go until it's done. So, that gives me the high percentage of students answering, um, <coughs> but I tried that. Um, they go <laughs> right up the left. Really? Is it a big class? They just stand outside the door. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right. And then you can see it. <laughs> so I, I've never done this as a student, but I have a quick question. When someone, when someone does the evaluation, do they get a screen saying, you have done this evaluation. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So in that case, we could oh, you could ask them to print it out or something and give it to us mm -hmm. just as evidence that they've done it, and that would be like a, yes. a there you go. Okay. It's, it's five points. You know. Yeah. So one thing that um, someone mentioned 
as a suggestion was <coughs> to gamify it as well. Oh. And so as the instructor, you can see a live uh, version of your response rate. And so as you tell everybody, you can set your computer up and then leave the room and just have some designated person refresh your screen to see what percentage of the class has submitted the evaluation. Thank and you. you tell them, we need to get to the threshold of 85%, and then if you, after 85%, I don't care if you finish it. But then everybody, it's like, okay, we'll do it. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Last comment, um, just, I had um, great success this past semester my second time teaching this intro course in simply increasing the response rate by having setting aside class time 20 minutes at the beginning of not just the final class but the penultimate class as well so that I could see the response rate after the first time and then I gave them another chance, I made another appeal of its significance and its importance and it was 20 minutes at the beginning of the class so that I could return so they couldn't skip out early say if they wanted to leave. So they used the beginning time go out in the hall and then return. Um, and that, that's for sure. I have, I have to say, I have somewhat ethical problems with any kind of gamification of the process or requiring them to do it, but you can um, just describe how it's useful to you and matters as an early career academic or something like that. Um, and I got a response rate of 90%. Okay. Um, okay, so we'll post this up on the website if you want to look at any of these strategies at a later time, but thank you for coming and thank you for sharing.